writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Welcome to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. I'm Chrissy. And I'm Stephanie. And today we're talking to New York Times and U.S. Today bestselling author Meredith Wilde. She is obviously a huge superstar. Many of you listening will have heard of her and or read her books. And after she skyrocketed to success on her own, she launched her own digital publishing company called Waterhouse Press, where she has in turn helped support a lot of other authors towards their best-selling success. So it's a really interesting story about kind of two layers of independent publishing and what she's learned from each side of her publishing experience so far. So stay tuned. Lots of great info in this episode. We are so very honored and delighted to have a superstar with us today on the podcast, Meredith Wild. So you started as a best-selling author and have transition that success into running a successful publishing business. So I want to get into both of those things. Welcome, Meredith. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So for anybody who doesn't know, I'd love to hear your perspective on who you are and what Waterhouse Press is trying to accomplish today. Sure. Well, it's been an interesting journey. I've been writing for about six years. I started out in a software development company that I was running on my own and started writing romance on the side, uh, which eventually turned into my full-time career, thankfully. So I started writing the Hacker series, which turned into a a five-book series that did very well, ended up getting picked up by a major publisher in New York. And at that point, you know, that's a very quick version of it, but it was a lot of, you know, pounding on doors and, you know, getting um, different opportunities with different, you know, vendors and promotional opportunities. But eventually, once, you know, my my books were under the care of another publisher, I had kind of built up this infrastructure of, you know, production and marketing. And I didn't want all that to go to waste. So I decided to start publishing other authors. I started small. The first author I signed was actually my editor, Helen Hart. Mm -hmm. Yep. And she is fantastically successful author now. We also picked up Audrey Carlin, who had a global success with her Calendar Girl series. And uh, the rest is history. We have 14 authors under our name now, and um, we're still a pretty small boutique operation, but we try to stay very focused on, you know, a select number of authors and bringing some of the, the best, most entertaining stories to our readers. Awesome. I didn't actually know that you had only been writing somewhat recently. You know, we hear some authors who've been kind of, you know, getting backlist from 25 years back that, but six years is not a super, super long time. That's interesting. So when you are working in the software... Starting out, I felt very intimidated by, you know, some of the bigger conferences because, I mean, there really are so many authors that have been doing this for years and years. And in that context, I felt very much like an entrepreneur over like, you know, a hardcore romance author, Yeah, um, you know, who'd who'd really, you know, knew the ropes and had, you know, all kinds of different traditional publishing and self-publishing experiences. Of course, I feel a little more seasoned now, (laughs) but, you know, on the writing front, I did major in English. So, you know, I I got my chops that way, at least. (laughs) Awesome. And when you were still working full time and writing, what did that balance look for you? Look like for you? Were you writing at night during your lunch break? Like, how did you kind of find or make the time to to do both? It was definitely a challenge. I have three children, and they were pretty young at the time, so they were handful (laughs) and taking a lot of my energy. So I would just I would go to the office and I would work, and I would come home and take care of the family and. I would carve out, you know, a few hours every night in my little home office and, and try to write some words down. And my husband was my first reader. He's he's always my first reader. And so I'd crank out some chapters and he'd read them and we'd talk about them. And, you know, I'd, I'd try to do the same thing the next night or, you know, whenever I had enough energy to do it. And eventually I finished the book <laughs> and mm. it was kind of a, you know, really triumphant feeling to have carved out enough time to do that. 
but yeah, it was, you know, it's hard, but it, you know, it's still hard. It's actually not a whole lot easier than it was <laughs> back then. It's not a, a very romantic, you know, I glide to my, you know, desk overlooking the water and <laughs> contemplate my character. It's not really like that. So it's usually a mad dash for a deadline and lots of Mountain Dew bottles and sleep deprivation. Yeah, I I was kind of liking the illusion of this CEO, beautiful, like Oval Office-ish setup. (laughs) What does your writing space look like these days? Well, like I said, it's kind of similar. I I do a lot of administrative work for the publishing company. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm working on other people's brands. I design a lot of our covers. I review a lot of our marketing materials and we have, you know, loads of meetings for all kinds of different things from distribution to, you know, just general operations. Yeah. And writing is, my own writing is really usually the last thing I do in a day, which, you know, it's hard to kind of block out creative time without interruptions until like, I'm, I'm kind of a night owl anyways. I think, you know, usually people are you know, they're, they like the quiet morning or they like the quiet evening, but there's that middle zone where all the emails are flying and people are talking and meeting things that it is really hard to like kind of get in the zone during those common hours. So yeah, like last night I wrote for like four hours until around like 1130 and I was like, I should really get some sleep. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I just, I kind of squeeze it in wherever I can. Yeah, well, it's kind of, it's pretty refreshing, actually, to hear that you're still (laughs) encountering the same struggles, no matter how far along you are. And I think I have young kids, too. It always is a challenge to squeeze in anything that feels like time for you, even if that's work time for you, you're cutting corners to get that time in. Right. There's always, you can always find a reason to, like, not do it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you have to kind of just force yourself to prioritize it. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to hear more of the Waterhouse Press story. Um, what made you want to launch that as, as a separate business? Because as authors self-publishing, you really are your own publishing house already. But what made you want to take that to the next level? And how did you want to do it? Well, I started the company really just incorporating it to have kind of an official sounding publishing name when I was, you know, trying to get re- set up relationships with different people in the industry and, you know, kind of trying to legitimize myself. And the intent wasn't always to bring other authors under the imprint. But once we did make that decision, it just it seemed like, you know, a natural progression of things, you know, coming from an entrepreneurial background. Uh, that's probably my default mode. <laughs> I just I have a habit of, you know, creating businesses. Just, I think that it's something that terrifies a lot of people. But for me, it comes very naturally just because I've, I've done it enough times now. So it's, it's not really very intimidating for me to kind of think of things on a larger scale. So yeah, we just, I mean, my husband's uh, responsible for, you know, all of our major marketing and between his efforts and, you know, I think one of the, my strong suits that I bring to the equation is I have a really strong branding eye. And that was a big part of it was, you know, the presentation of, you know, authors and series and these, you know, professional brands that, you know, could compete, you know, with the ones that are being put out by larger publishers. So we just basically pooled our, our knowledge and our skill set. And we had, you know, some great authors to work with who are excited about the opportunity to, you know, take things to the next level with us. Yeah. So yeah. You also pooled your resources, right? You and you took some financial risks to get it off the ground. Yeah, definitely. Um, my husband's the risk taker in our, our duo here. So yeah, we. I mean, I had my business, but it wasn't like doing like crazy well. It was it was doing okay, highs and lows, as with any business. But you know, I guess we had just enough rope to <laughs> to work with when we were starting to market my books. We did take some financial risks on on marketing spend and, you know, trying out different ways to, to reach readers and, and see how those efforts affected sales. And um, once we started to really see results, we borrowed quite a bit. But at that point, we were borrowing against receivables. You know, we had yeah. already earned a lot. And so it was just kind of a matter of getting ahead of those. 
those royalty payments and so that we could keep momentum. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember when you guys really launched and hearing about how much dedicated force and monetary support you were putting behind the online marketing, especially it was almost like shocking at the time thinking like, wow, this is quite a a significant investment and thinking about publishing in a very different way, most significantly on the marketing side, because with a trad deal, the vast majority of books are not ever going to get anything like that level of support versus for that calendar girls series. Like it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, even with the hacker series, it was, I mean, it seemed like a lot that we were spending. It was, yeah, you know, it was dramatic for us, you know, um, paying attention to how much was going out. And then we had more capital to work with when the Calendar Girl series completed. And so, yeah, I mean, millions of dollars were spent, which is, you know, really kind of unheard of, but it really, it really launched her and her series into the spotlight and the global spotlight. And she's had amazing international success and some really awesome opportunities because of it. Yeah, absolutely. So on the Waterhouse website, you describe yourselves as an untraditional publisher. So I mentioned the marketing, which was quite untraditional. Um, what else does untraditional mean to you? Well, I mean, you know, not not to discredit larger publishers because, you yep. know, it's it's just kind of part of being a larger company is you, you know, it, it is harder to be agile and, and extremely responsive to you know, changes and trends and, you know, just just maneuvering quickly and easily um, without it being too cumbersome. So that's one of the benefits of having a small kind of boutique operation is that we can, um, you know, we can pay attention to hourly trends. You know, Mm -hmm. we we don't have to, you know, figure out red tape two weeks out. You know, we can we can shift our strategies pretty quickly. So even though we do, you know, we have more traditional elements to our company now with you know, kind of a longer publishing schedule, you know, selling books into bookstores and, and that type of thing, long run prints, all that. Mm-hmm. Um, we still have the ability to, you know, switch things up and um, and look at things in, you know, unique ways. And, you know, of course, we, we also have the ability to, you know, do kind of unique promotions with different uh, vendors, you know, like Kobo, we have the freedom to, you know, explore unique ideas and, you know, figure out how to, how to make success on, you know, a lot of different promotions. Awesome. And in terms of being all remote, you know, you're not New York based, obviously, I think none of you are right. Some of there's some Boston in there at some point, but you're all scattered, right? Yeah, we're between Boston and different points, Florida. Yeah. How um, do you find that serves the organization, each person kind of getting to operate independently and not having the overhead, obviously, of of a New York space? Well, you know what? I think it all comes down to your team and everybody knows on our team that they kind of own their part of the process. You know, at the same time, we all help each other and, you know, we're all working together as a team. And I mean, it works out. I mean, there's definitely, you know, I kind of do miss having like in-person meetings with people, but you know, there's Slack video conferencing, which I've oh, yeah. forced everybody to <laughs> to participate in on a weekly basis now. So I could see everyone's faces. Yeah. But I mean, it works out. It's obviously like not super uncommon anymore. You know, the telecommute life and, you know, I, I know that it makes it a lot easier for people to just have kind of a, a more flexible situation. And um, I mean, it works out. I really have no complaints. I think we have a really awesome team and we get it all done. So Amazing. So you have, with Waterhouse, launched some aspects of publishing that Indie still struggles with. Primarily, I wanted to ask you about print, foreign rights, and audio. So you have created relationships with like sub rights agents, which I think would be fairly difficult to do on an individual author scale. But with each of those, what do you think an independent indie author could learn or potentially apply to growing their own business? Well, I mean, it's not impossible to get foreign rights representation. We are kind of a little bit spread out over a few agencies now, but there are definitely people out there who um, work in the romance field and doesn't necessarily mean you have to be on a traditional track to sell foreign rights. 
Yep. Um, you can just be represented for foreign. So, you know, if you have the sales to back it, you know, there's definitely opportunities there. Keeping in mind that there's highs and lows with every territory. So it's not always an easy sell in certain places. What would you say um, are, are the more challenging and more potentially rewarding ones for you so far? Well, the major markets are France, Germany, and Brazil, of course. But France and Brazil both kind of, you know, had some hiccups recently. So those used to be kind of like the signalers. You know, if you can sell rights in one or all of those, then, you know, the rest will follow kind of idea from yeah. my experience anyways. Yeah. So, you know, just things change. I mean, countries are dealing with all kinds of different things. There's, you know, there's different publishing dynamics in different places. You know, trends fall off. Romance, you know, maybe isn't a hot topic anymore in some places. So you just kind of have to roll with it and accept change, I guess. When it comes to audio, I, I had the benefit of kind of having a relationship um, with an audio publisher already. And I mean, really with all of these things, it's not like it's a closed door just because you're an indie. And, and that was one of the things that I really fought against in those kind of early days when there were successful indies, but maybe there weren't a lot of avenues for indies to be taken seriously by the larger companies. But if you have the numbers and you're putting a good product out there, there's no reason why you can't create relationships with these companies and get audio deals and foreign deals. So, you know, they're just like anybody else. They want to get successful books and, you know, have them supported by the author and wider marketing campaign that will hopefully, you know, help them as well. So, you know, they're not out of reach. And it's just a matter of kind of getting yourself to, you know, a, a point where your numbers warrant those kinds of deals. Yeah. And then on the print side, what? Um, yeah, the print. <laughs> I've heard mixed. Hard. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> mixed reviews from authors who have done it on their own. You know, trying to get a, a like, let's say Ingram copies into Walmart for, as one example, and dealing with yeah. stock and returns and all of that. Yeah, it is hard. It's definitely. I. That's probably one of the most common questions that people come to me with. You know, how do I figure out this print thing? And it, there's just not one easy solution to it. And, and one of the hard parts is that it's very expensive. So, you know, and it's time consuming as well. And, and there's just a lot of different pieces to that puzzle in terms of warehousing and distribution and, you know, getting on a sales cycle where, you know, bookseller recognizes your publishing imprint and, you know, they're on your, you're on their radar and, you know, they're going to, you know, do a national buy and all this. You know, everybody wants their books in stores. It's a dream for a lot of authors. I'll never forget when I first saw my book in stores, really big deal. And Ingram is definitely one solution, but it's just like anything else. You have to have the numbers to warrant, you know, their sales effort as well. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> I wish I could kind of advise on like a, a variety of solutions, but it's definitely a hard part. And I mean, obviously, that's why people go to POD, because that's it's easy. It's just it's nice to kind of have, you know, special effects or, you know, have a lower unit cost for like each year paperback. So you can actually make a little bit of money on the print. But it's also it's a big risk to print a lot of books ahead of time and hope that they sell through. Right. Absolutely. So yeah, I think with print, especially if it was super easy to get your print books into stores everybody would be doing it but i think incrementally at a slower pace than ebooks it, those doors are opening yeah well when i first started i mean i was doing print on demand and i was still getting stocked in burns and noble so it's possible it's just kind of you kind of have to be aware of your threshold i guess you know where it doesn't make sense anymore to do print on demand like i had a situation where i was actually having a hard time getting the print on demand books printed in okay. high enough volumes, <laughs> which was um, a good problem. But at that point, obviously it made more sense to do, you know, offset printing and kind of figure something else out. Yeah. So are there any other major 
learning curve points that you learned from the Waterhouse experience that you think our listeners as indie authors could apply to their own businesses? I know that's like a huge question and you could get into all kinds of nitty gritty, but when you hear that, is there anything that immediately jumps into mind? Like if I had known this, doing it on my own would have been so much easier or faster? Well, that's an extremely difficult question to answer because it's really tied into, you know, what an individual author's goals are. If it's fame and fortune and, you know, selling tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of books, you know, that's one thing. But um, it's hard to kind of give advice on like, you know, what's going to really move the needle um, without kind of also having that influence like your creative goals too. For example, one of the things that I've kind of been thinking about and and talking about with authors who ask is consistency, which is funny because I don't consider myself very consistent (laughs) because I get bored. So I like to try a lot of different things and sometimes it's not always the best thing for my brand. (laughs) Yeah. You've written across genres. The red letter is pretty different for you. You know, I would say that like objectively looking at some of the more successful indie authors right now, they are some of the most consistent writers. You know, they have very, very similar themes, brands. They're turning a book out every two months or so. You know, their readers aren't forgetting about them. They're ready and hungry for the next book. Um, And they haven't interrupted that flow for years, basically. So. I mean, I'd say that's a really great formula for success if it works for you creatively. Now, I would have a difficult time with that personally because I like to try different stuff and I also like to take breaks and, you know, so creatively it's not really, it's not really for me. Yeah. But I mean, you have to stay true to your passions too because, you know, if you chase success too much and it'll definitely take its toll on you in terms of enjoying the writing, which is, you know, ultimately that is why you should be doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a business side of things that obviously everyone's interested in, you know, they want to do well, but you know, this, these stories have to, you know, come from a good place. You know, that's, that's really the important thing is staying true to your passion and your craft. Yeah. Absolutely. I feel like we've talked to a couple authors on the show in the past who've taken a break from what their fans really want and done a book or a series of, you know, let's say romantic comedy or something that they really like. And yeah, maybe it dilutes or changes the brand a bit, but it keeps them sane and lets them keep going later that year or the next year, right? Exactly. Yeah. So having kind of hit a big success story individually and several as a publisher. What is still really exciting for you right now in the industry in terms of new, you know, you could call them trends. I don't really like the idea of like trend watching because who knows, (laughs) but um, yeah, like what do you see happening that like makes you still motivated to get up and run the business and then write for four hours every day? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have to be careful of trends, obviously. You know, you can be the, a kind of author that kind of chases all of the trends. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. But I, I think something that I'm seeing more that, that's really positive is authors kind of pooling their resources and working together in different ways and um, really coming up with some kind of like unique promotions too. I think what's really exciting now versus when I first started is, you know, the the many relationships that authors now have directly with platforms like Kobo and, you know, like larger businesses' willingness to work with us and our kind of -of out-of-the-box ideas um, and coming up with unique promotions that, you know, combined with our efforts because we're all like grassroots marketers and we'll try anything to move some books. So, you know, there's a lot more of that happening, which is really exciting to see when, you know, several years ago, that was almost unheard of. Yep, I would totally agree. And we have the one that's just running right now with uh, with Kobo as one key example. I don't know if yeah. that's what you're specifically talking about, but it, that's one that I'm really yeah. I've been really involved in, and you you are now involved in. Where we're offering a buy one get one free with all kinds of awesome authors, and a lot of the marketing coming directly from you guys, pitching directly to your readers, and yeah, offering something unique to fans. Right, definitely. 
And then just in terms of what's next, what goals are on the horizon for you? Are you a, a vision setter? Are you a, you know, one year, three year, five year approach to your either side of your business life? Sort of, I guess. Uh, I mean, it's just, we're always just so busy with what's going on that I wouldn't say I plan really far into the future because I've got a lot on my plate anyway, but we have a new author that we've recently acquired and we're going to be putting out a couple YA series with her, which I'm really excited about. So we get to kind of play in the different genre, which is, you know, loosely connected to, you know, romance anyways. I think it's going to appeal to a lot of our, our readers anyways. We're going to be moving a little bit into foreign as well. It's partly out of, you know, maybe a little bit of frustration that it's hard to be beholden to the markets and, you know, and the the publishers who kind of hold the keys to those opportunities. So we're excited to kind of branch out and experiment with a few different things in foreign markets as well. Very cool. And I'm excited to see, can you say who the YA author is or is it still secret? Yes, it's Danielle Rose. (laughs) Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Nice. (laughs) Sometimes you guys will hint at things and then it's just really (laughs) delightful. It's always a really delightful surprise. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, we're um, really, really excited. Awesome. And do you know yet what the launch schedule will look like for that? We're looking at probably late fall. So mm-hmm. we're still kind of pulling things together a little bit and, you know, creating her brand, which is always like a fun, you know, makeover process between us and the author and um, making everything cohesive under under the Waterhouse umbrella. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're still kind of in the early stages, but I think it's going to come together pretty quickly. And yeah, I think it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, that's actually one last point that I wanted to to just focus on because you mentioned that earlier in terms of something that Waterhouse offers of building up an author's brand. And we get that question a lot at Kobo Writing Life. Um, they're like, what do you recommend as key areas of focus for a newer author trying to build a cohesive brand in let's say YA or romance like what do you say are basics the essentials to to really launch successfully well i mean i think one of the best things you can do is go to the bookstore and look at book covers you know compare series under the same author you know look at how people are positioning themselves visually in the market and then figure out what resonates with you one of the things that was important to me personally um, when I started out was I wanted covers that weren't very obviously romance. Mm-hmm. Um, they were kind of mysterious and left a little bit to the imagination, which I think has turned out pretty well for my books as well as Helen's, you know, and others. You know, it's a kind of book I always say, you know, you can read it on the train and nobody knows you're reading a saucy romance. And, you know, it's kind of a little more mainstream friendly. Yep. So that's, that's always something we kind of aim for. And I think it's, it's generally good advice. It may not necessarily be in line with what a lot of other indie authors are doing. But if it works, you know, if putting couples on your books works, then definitely do that. If you want to, you know, try to establish a different brand, my advice is just to try to be as consistent as possible. Yeah, I definitely remember that about when you were when your books were coming out and when you launched Helen. It does make an easier job of merchandising them from a Kobo perspective because we can't always put the saucier romance covers and put in front of all of our readers. Um, not to say that you should right. hide what you're writing about; it should convey what the book is. But you know, there's like a a customer line that we have to draw at some point or another. So having the more suggestive, let's say, E.L. James-ish, but, you know, reimagined in the many years since then has its upsides for sure. Right. And anything specific that you've seen change, you know, in the romance community? It's been a bit of a, an interesting year, I would say. <laughs> anything that you're really excited to see happening in terms of, of those titles or how you guys hope to fit into that genre? Well, I mean, we have a pretty good foothold in it, um, which is, you know, obviously really beneficial. You know, the industry is going to continue to evolve. You know, readers are going to be looking for certain kinds of stories. You know, um, one of the things we've kind of, you know, we're kind of, 
identifying, you know, the types of stories, tropes, kind of mainstream themes that resonate best with people, which is kind of interesting because I think that when you work in publishing long enough, you kind of want to be like stimulated by kind of odd stories or maybe outside the norm, but maybe that's not exactly what resonates with a broader readership. So that's interesting to kind of, you know, continue our education of like, you know, what's interesting now, what's going to be interesting tomorrow. And, you know, it's like anything, you're just trying to stay ahead of what people want and then, you know, be ready to give them the kind of stories that they're going to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I love that. Any last words of wisdom from your area of now expertise for any listeners who are maybe at the beginning of their efforts towards publishing? Well, the advice I always give everybody when they're starting out is to find a good editor, invest in yourself and do everything you can to put out a product that, you know, you'd be proud to set next to, you know, any other book that a, you know, a big publisher is going to put out there. Um, I'm a big proponent of quality. um, And I think that that's something that'll definitely go the distance. Yeah. I agree with you on that one, a hundred percent. Thank you so much. Well, I know you have a lot on your plate and (laughs) lots of other people's books and your own books to get back to. So I will leave you to it, but I thank you so much for sharing your time and your story with us today, Meredith. All right. Thanks so much. It was fun. So we hope you enjoyed our interview, not my interview, Chrissy's interview with Meredith. And stay tuned next week because we'll be talking to Brent Pilkey. And he is actually, he's an author, but also a retired 51 Division Toronto police officer. Ooh. Uh, so if crime and mystery and thrillers are your thing, make sure to tune in next week. Awesome. They're definitely my thing. And we often, Steph and I, talk about our true crime obsession. So I can't wait for that episode. And if you would like to hear even more interviews with authors... I would recommend that you check out the Kobo In Conversation podcast, where our CEO, Michael Tamblin, interviews famous authors such as Mark Sakamoto, who wrote Forgiveness, and several other awesome guests who come into the Kobo headquarters and share their stories with us. So Kobo In Conversation, wherever you listen to your podcasts. But you know, most of all, let's be honest, we're very grateful that you listen to this podcast. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.